Now at 7, it became one of the most notorious hangouts for some of South Florida's shadiest characters in the 1980s. The Mutiny Hotel in Coconut Grove hosted wild parties attended by cocaine cowboys, hitmen, gun runners, and movie stars. Now we're learning more about the mutiny from a new book that may be coming to a theater near you. Joining me tonight is the author of Hotel Scarface, Robin Farzad, who grew up here in South Florida. Nice to be that nice to Pleasure see you. Pleasure to see you. I think you're cited in the book also. You've been to so many different newspapers and news stations. Well, I have been working here a long you're time. You're a historical figure. I just yourself. want to say how much I love that Miami sweatshirt. Oh, thank you. I wore it just for you. All you need is a turnover chain. All right. <laughs> All right let, let's go back to the 1980s. I, sure. I lived here, you were here, you were much younger, but let's take the audience back to the 1980s. What was going on in Miami during that time period, and specifically, what was going on at the Mutiny Hotel in Coconut Grove? If you rewind back, to the 70s and the early 80s, just go back and look at a photo of the skyline of Miami. There's one building, maybe the Centrust Tower. South Beach had not arrived. It was kind of one big old age home neighborhood. Uh, the one hot spot where celebs would come to, where dopers would go to, where uh, Venezuelan oil money would go to was right on the corner of South Bayshore Drive, the mutiny. Um, and, you know, it also had a recording studio next door where the Eagles recorded, Stevie Nicks would show up, um, you name them, Crosby, uh, uh, Neil Young. It was kind of like our Studio 54 in the absence of everything else. And what about the, uh, the, the criminals that were there, the drug dealers, the cocaine cowboys? Who were some of those guys? Well, you had a, well, you, you, you're familiar with the $5 billion cash surplus that the Federal Reserve of Miami had at the turn of the decade in 1980. That's just a crap ton of money. You need to spend it. Um, for example, on, on pouring uh, Dom Perignon down your hot tub, uh, that's where you would go to spend ostentatiously. And the party girls would see you and the celebs would see you. Um, Money was no object. You'd park your car in the front. So to the extent that this town was really overrun with, with hot cash, uh, this was its primary saloon that had everything for sale. And this is where they went to party. If all these guys were there, why didn't the police just show up at the mutiny and arrest them? Because it was a symbiotic relationship. They needed the cops. If you were a good, smart doper, you look at somebody like a Mono Morales, Monkey Morales, right. who's legendary if you look him up. Um, he knew to play the tres letras against one another, the DEA, the FBI, the MPD, you know, the IRS even, you were always informing. And with the Cuban mafia, it was told to me that it was nothing personal. You did it out of self-preservation. And similarly, if you're the cops, morale is awful in 1980, 1981, where we become the cocaine and murder capital of the country. You needed informants, ideally nonviolent dopers, to tell you who the most murderous people were. Tell me, Robin, about a character in your book who became the inspiration for Tony Montana in the movie Scarface. You know, I look at somebody like Mario Tabrawi, which, you know, he's a wildlife-loving uh, kingpin. He now owns a, a zoo in West Miami-Dade. Um, he looked like Tony Montana when I saw him. I mean, the picture that he shared with me from 1979, I could see how Oliver Stone and Brian De Palma go there and decide to make a composite of all these people. Having said that, you know, 35, 36 years have since passed since Scarface, and how many Cuban dopers, ex-Cuban dopers have said, you know what, he's based on me. <laughs> so you know you're on to something if more than five or six people say that. And I know the, uh, there's still a mutiny hotel in Coconut Grove, but it's not the same building. Yeah, I mean, this place was abandoned at the end of the 80s. Hurricane Andrew did a number on it. I saw it in 94. It was gutted in the late 90s and opened up as a kind of a corporate hotel. Uh, there's still certain shadows of its old self. The club is not there anymore, maybe the shape of the pool. There was a staff reunion in March, and one of the hostesses, uh, she's infamous in the book, Mutiny Molly, insists that the lobby smells the same. <laughs> so the ghosts always linger. The ghosts linger. Now tell me about uh, the possibility of your book becoming either a TV series or a movie. Yeah, there were so many things I had to leave on the cutting room floor, so many stories to kind of cram this into a kilo-sized book, if you will, <laughs> 320 pages. So I was looking for some sort of multimedia second life, and we got uh, really lucky with Stone Village Productions. They did uh, Empire Falls on HBO, uh, Las Vegas on NBC. They've adapted many books like Love in the Time of Cholera or The Human Stain. So we're going to try to show a, a, a premium cable or TV treatment of this. So, fingers crossed. I, I can't wait to watch it. Robin Farza, thank you very much. Elliot, and you're here for the Miami Book Fair. We should uh, plug that real quick. I'm here, yes. Sunday, 4.30, presenting at the Wolfson Campus. And um, would love to see you. You go to hotelscarface.com if you want the book. I sing, I tap dance, I do everything. <laughs> a uniquely Miami story by an author who grew up here in South Florida. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Elliot. CBS 4 News at 7 continues in one minute.